I've pretty much since Apple II's existed been interested in playing games. So since I was a kid, I've known that either I wanted to run a candy factory because Willy Wonka was my favorite uh, movie growing up or run a game shop. So that was sort of the inception of the idea. I had no idea that uh, this was all gonna turn into Blizzard. I just thought making games would be fun and managed to talk a couple of cool guys in college into, uh, into coming on board and here, you know, we are 20 years later. I met Alan, uh, actually, my last year at UCLA. I noticed that there was this guy in both of my classes and there was one day Alan and I both showed up early uh, to the computer architecture class and I saw him and I thought I'd be really smart because I thought he looked Israeli. I said, so where in Israel are you from? And he looked at me kind of puzzled. He said, what? And I said, where are you from? And he said, oh, I'm from Egypt. I don't remember that, but that's the one Mike tells. The one I remember is we were sitting side by side at UCLA in one of the computer labs and uh, I had gotten up to go get a cup of coffee, go to the bathroom, and I had locked my computer system. And when I came back, I sat down, I typed in my password, the system unlocked, and I kept working. And this guy sitting next to me, who I didn't know, was Mike, turned to me and he said, hey, how'd you do that? And I said, um, do what? He said, while you were gone, your system unlocked itself, and I relocked it using my password. And so it turned out and what are the chances Mike and I were both using the same password to lock our, uh, our computer systems. He graduated slightly before me, about um, three months, maybe six months, but he kind of knew what the plan was, and uh, he was down here in Irvine working at Western Digital. He got in his head that I should quit my job at Western Digital and go into business with him making games. Much to the chagrin of his uh, parents, his father in particular thought it was crazy to leave uh, a good job for this crazy startup with a 22-year-old kid, but I think uh, his dad knows he made the right decision now. I borrowed uh, $15,000 from my grandmother, uh, $10,000 went into the company, $5,000 went into my bank account, and that's pretty much what I lived off of for the next two years. Frank is a similar story. We were also both in the computer science department. I attended UCLA to study computer science and engineering, and while I was there, I was fortunate enough to meet Alan Adham through a mutual acquaintance. We had a, an AI class together, artificial intelligence, and it was so boring. It was so boring that I used to ditch all the time, and I'd go to Ackerman Union at UCLA and play video games. I would always see the same guy there. He had the same AI class. I think we saw each other like, the first day and maybe on test days and that was about it because we were both always ditching and playing video games. When I was growing up, I always felt like I wanted to make computer games but I really had no idea how to go about doing it. Um, Alan also knew that he wanted to make computer games but he knew exactly how he wanted to go about doing it. And right after Alan graduated, uh, we happened to chat on the phone and he said, Frank, I want to talk to you about about what I'm doing next. I want you to be a part of it. And he invited me to, to come make computer games with him. Uh, I left my job at Rockwell and I came to, to work with Alan. And that was actually the first time I met Mike Morheim was the first day. We uh, built desks together. That was our first day. It was a very small space, about 600 square feet. And right out the gate, we started working on ports of uh, Amiga and Mac titles. Um, which was actually really great exposure for us because having never authored code for a computer game before, this gave us a huge code base to look at. There was this attitude that it didn't matter what our project was, we were going to learn how to do it and we could learn anything that we set our minds to. Initially, uh, we were called Silicon and Synapse. Silicon, the building block of the computer, and Synapse, the building block of the human mind. Computers, brains, Creativity, technology, nobody got it. What we actually got over the phone was, silicone, isn't that what you put in women's breast implants? And what the hell is a synapse? You know, when we first started, we just had this idea that we were looking for smart, passionate people who loved games, loved uh, learning about game development. We just wanted to make great games. It was really as simple as that. Our biggest criteria was we wanted kind of cool people who we thought would vibe with the company who played video games. And that applied to everybody. 
I think that sort of the pre-Warcraft orcs and humans era of Blizzard um, really allowed us to grow um, the talent pool at the company. We hired our first 3D artist. His name was Joey Ray Hall. <sighs> our early hires in, in the art group were like, I think uh, Sam came in, Sam Wise. I saw an ad in the newspaper it said, make art for video games. And that was all it said, really descriptive. I think a programmer wrote it. Computer programming, we just wanted guys who were really into games and really into computer coding. Bob came in, he was obviously a D&D geek and an excellent programmer. I walk in in my uh, I love toxic waste t-shirt with a Tasmanian devil on the front, shorts and a t-shirt, sandals, and uh, apparently it struck a chord with the three guys there. So I came in uh, for the interview, and the first thing I saw was this cute little receptionist uh, named Frank Pierce. The time they had me answering the phones, um, and honestly, I don't think I'm the best person to be answering the phones because I don't always have the most pleasant personality. He opened up his mouth and said, yeah, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm here to see Alan Atham. And he said, well, Alan's on a meeting. Can you go I'll talk to Mike? <laughs> And so I met with Mike. I had my portfolio of art, which basically consisted of every single piece of art I had framed on the wall. I just threw into a big uh, case, brought it in. And after that, he showed it to Alan, and they offered me the job there. They hired me to work on rock and roll racing. Written for the Super Nintendo. Uh, it was a, a new version of RPM racing that the company had done as one of their first startup games and we were i think the first american developer to uh develop and release a title for the super famicom and we did it we literally were using untranslated japanese documents rock and roll racing i didn't work on that uh when i started it was just sort of a normal racing game and very much just a evolution of the rpm racing we had been doing it was also kind of funny because we knew that race car games should have cool driving music. And before rock and roll racing, nobody had really used rock music at all. So I programmed rock and roll racing using assembly language for a 6502 processor. Hemi, hemi, hemi. We added uh, spaceships and space aliens and all sorts of laser car sort of stuff. And we just kind of evolved it into a little bit cooler style of a, a game again some of the Blizzard influence developing there, where instead of doing the normal cars, we made rocket cars with lasers and guns and that kind of stuff. And that, plus the fact that it was an excellent game, Rock and Roll Racing took uh, Racing Game of the Year that year. So the, the first uh, SNES title that I worked on in earnest was uh, Lost Vikings, and we had almost everyone in the office working on that project. When I started on Lost Vikings, there were about a hundred Vikings you could control. Some that would raise up ladders, someone that would throw torches, all that sort of thing. It was very uh, PC game oriented. We were sort of inspired by uh, Lemmings, a little PC game where you had a ton of little guys and they would just kind of walk around the screen. And so we decided to make it a little bit more friendly for the Super Nintendo and we dropped it down to five characters, then to four, then to three. But it also had a lot of puzzles and a lot of level design and a lot more creative stuff that we were putting into it than we had needed to, I would say, previously. For Lost Vikings, what I, I was responsible for doing all the layouts for all of the um, puzzles and all the, the levels within Lost Vikings. We used a program called CED that Mike Morheim had written for this purpose to lay things out. CED, the cell editor. This was my first project at, uh, at Blizzard. It was a C++ uh, project written uh, completely in uh, Zortec C++ and uh, learned how to program in C++. It was also the, the first forerunner for the uh, map editor that would later become part of StarCraft and WarCraft and um, our, our games moving forward. That's kind of our first move of taking sort of PC style artwork and bringing it more into the Blizzard art style where it's a little bit more cartoony, it's a little bit more accessible to the console market. It went on to win uh, Puzzle Game of the Year in the same year that Rock and Roll Racing won Racing Game of the Year. And so our tiny little company with about 20 employees won two, I think, of the top seven awards that year. Keeping in mind, we were competing against companies like 
Sega and Nintendo and Konami and Capcom, I think we may have been the only company to win two of the seven top awards. I was the lead, lead, lead programming guy on uh, on Blackthorn, which was uh, one of the few games that we've done over the years that didn't actually have a multiplayer component to it. It was inspired by a couple of cool games that at the time we thought were really fun, kind of blends between, uh, you know, puzzle games and shooters. Blackthorn was actually our first uh, rotoscope game. We actually took Frank Pierce out in the back alley and um, got him to jump over a bunch of wood and got him to run and, and climb ladders and things like that, and we'd videotape him. Then we'd come back in and, and we'd draw over him for the character. It was a little bit dry and a little bit boring, so we ended up making it on some far off planet. And for some reason, this guy with the dirty t-shirt and jeans is a prince. And like all princes, they have shotguns. It was a pretty quick development. I don't remember it taking very long. When I think back on Blackthorn, the funny thing I think about it is that the two artists that were primarily responsible for creating the character art for Blackthorn um, both had long, stringy hair. And if you look at all the character art in Blackthorn, including the main character, they've got this long, stringy hair. And it's like, wow, these artists basically created this character art in their own image. And so I think we need more diversity among our artists working on any one project so that we get diversity in that character art. I guess the other funny story to go along with that was we had to change the name in Europe from Blackthorn to Black Hawk. Uh, Blackthorn turns out to be a really popular brand of beer in Europe. So it'd be like, I guess, if we had named our product Budweiser. In the early years, uh, the company pretty much lived on royalties that we got from the games we worked on or the ports that we worked on. But there were times when, when there just wasn't enough money to pay salaries and stuff like that. On paper, it always looked like we were just a couple months away from being completely in the black and having a windfall of, um, of excess cash to work with, and it never really happened. Mike and I tried to, you know, shelter everybody from anything other than making the games. We found out that you could actually get interest-free advances on your discovery card by uh, going to the supermarket and getting um, cash back. They would go and they would cash in their credit cards at the local market and then put the money in the bank account so that they could still make payroll. And although we never missed the payroll, it's really a miracle that we never missed a payroll because we were always a week away from being unable to uh, to make payroll. And some people knew about this and some people didn't. And and it, but those of us that did, we we know the kind of people these men are, and we knew then that we would work for these people forever. And so it was a pretty lean uh, couple of years early on, but amazingly still super super fun. The company sort of grew beyond the point where our Discover cards couldn't handle it anymore. So we each went to our parents and we got them to put each $20,000 into a bank account, so $40,000. And um, at the time that um, we sold the company to Davidson and Associates, we completely maxed out the $40,000 credit, credit line. And so, yeah, I mean, it was pretty tight for the first few years. So that was a period where we were transitioning from being a third-party developer where we would make products for other companies based on their ideas. The next step up was being sort of a joint developer where we would take our own concepts and, uh, and pitch them like Lost Vikings. And then we decided we wanted to try self-publishing and we had started um, with Warcraft the idea there was that it would still be published by an established publisher who had distribution, but we would control the packaging, we would sort of control the marketing, and our name would go on the front of the box. In the middle of that process, Bob and Jan Davidson came along. Uh, we became aware of silicon and, silicon and Synapse because we had a product called KidWorks, which needed to be transformed into Windows. And they took on the project, they did it, on budget, on time. I heard about Silicon and Synapse when I started at Davidson and Associates. And interestingly enough, when I arrived, the first thing that I was asked to do was do contractual due diligence to acquire this little company that Davidson was looking at. Our interest in buying them came because we had achieved a larger and larger market share of the educational software market. And a larger business, much larger, was the entertainment side of uh, PC software. One night, Bob just said to Alan, he goes, how much do you want? And Alan gave him an astronomical amount and thinking that Bob would just go, no way, that's way too much. And Bob said, yes, 
we were a public company at the time, I believe, and so uh, uh, we had, you know, we had the wherewithal to, to do that. But we didn't know if they had an interest in selling, but I guess Interplay uh, made them an offer or approached them about uh, acquiring more of them. Interplay back in those days uh, was the cream of the crop. They were an excellent company and uh, had a lot of really, really good people. We always thought, well, Interplay had a bit of an advantage because they, you know, they were culturally aligned with, uh, with the folks at Silicon and Synapse. Uh, on the other hand, we were adults. <laughs> and uh, one of the things they were looking for was adults to do the business side of the business. They basically said, nothing has to change. You guys continue doing just what you're doing now. You guys are really good at making games. We're really good at educational software. We'll handle the sales and distribution for you, but nothing has to change. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. These guys are creative and you can't control, you know, creative talent. You've got to let it do what it's gonna do. And I said, they're more than creative. They understand their consumers. They are their consumers. Finally, on a Friday, Alan called me and said, you know, your company's really very attractive, but, you know, we've been doing business with Interplay for quite a while, and uh, we think we're going to go that direction. And uh, Jan came in my office a little while later, and I said, well, the, the guys down at Silicon and Synapse have decided to go to Interplay. She said, really, can I talk to Alan? I said, be my guest. <laughs> and uh, she did. So I'll let her describe that conversation. Well, I called him up and I said, you have made a big mistake. And he said, well, you know, we've been sitting on the floor and we were thinking that we may have done the worst thing we've ever done to ourselves. And I said, you've made a big mistake and I want you to think about it some more. The following Monday, Alan uh, called me and he said, I've been thinking about what Jan has said all weekend and I didn't get a minute's sleep. And I'm thinking, that's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, so finally said, you know, we really want adults, we really want the business acumen that we see with the folks at uh, Davidson. And he said, we're gonna change our mind, we'll go with you. They said that we would be able to completely retain our creative control over the games we were making and um, that has managed to uh, allow us to protect our autonomy all of these years. And I think we've got a, a setup that is totally unique in terms of divisions of uh, larger organizations having this time, type of autonomy. It wasn't hard for us to, to uh, allow Blizzard to do its thing, but there was always a little caveat. As long as it was working, <laughs> you know, if it's not working, uh, we may have to do something, but it always worked. Uh, there wasn't a time when it didn't work. Well, I think any name change for our company was uh, was was destined to be better than Silicon and Synapse. Uh, at some point, Alan decided um, we sh we need to change our name. So there was this sort of brainstorming effort, and we wound up with Chaos Studios which we felt was pretty representative of our development process, which I'm told is still pretty representative of our development process. A lot of people thought it said Chaos or Chads. And then we got a phone call from a company called T Chaos Technologies. They're based out in Florida, and they basically said, hey, we have the name Chaos, but we're happy to let you continue using it, but it will cost you $100,000. And we said, ooh, okay, no thanks, we'll pick a different name. One of the first things that happened after the acquisition was Alan calls and said, well, we had a big meeting and we don't like the, the name Chaos anymore. We want to change it. So we were going through some other ideas and then we had an idea for Ogre Studios. Well, at the time we were already um, part of Davidson and Associates and when Alan presented the new name Ogre Studios to Jan Davidson, she hated it. I said, oh, hmm, that's interesting. Can I get back to you on that? So. Uh, I had a little chat with Jan, and uh, she had kind of an initial, you know, thump. <laughs> um, thought that the name might be a little scary for the kids. I called Alan back, and I said, you know, I did promise you that you'd have your own independence, and this is kind of embarrassing, but this does seem to have some impact, uh, according to Jan and our marketing folks, and they know better than I on, on our business. Uh, so we ended up changing that name as well to something a little bit more friendly, and I think the way we figured it out was Alan came in one weekend with seven words he picked out of the dictionary. 
Midnight Studios was one, which sort of sounds like a porn company, maybe. And uh, Blizzard Entertainment, which came up clean. And thank thankfully, we navigated all of those mediocre and sometimes bad names and wound up with a really awesome name like Blizzard. We went from boobies to ogres to chads to Blizzard. I remember, this was hundreds of years ago, uh, a chap by the name of Chris Metzen came in and he walked into my office. Alan was showing him around and he noticed that I had a lot of D&D stuff on the walls and so he and I were immediately uh, connected there, geeks. I was uh, playing with a band many years ago and um, at one of the gigs we were doing, uh, I, I guess I was drawing on a, on a cocktail napkin or something. A friend of a friend came by and saw it and, and uh, said, hey, you know, there's this place down in Costa Mesa hiring for artists. And I, I didn't really know what the place was. I thought it was like some kind of graphic.